Welcome to a podcast about wealth and life. We all know that our finances play a big part in how we live our lives. In this podcast, the advisors from Foster and Motley share insights and information about investment and financial planning topics and how they connect to your life. Contrary to what many people think, insurance is not just for when you die. It's also not just to cover when bad things happen. Well, there are many types of insurance and many uses. And Tony Luckhart is here to talk insurance with me, Patrice Sikora. Tony, insurance usually gets a pretty bad rap. Why? Well, you know, Patrice, it's insurance. You know, <laughs> it's not death and taxes. It's slightly better than death and taxes. With death and taxes, it's about think that's things that will happen. At least with insurance, we're kind of figuring out the things that, that may happen and try to protect against those. So it's slightly better from that perspective. Well, except for life insurance, that's pretty much going to happen, isn't it? Well, yeah, depending upon the type of life insurance that you have, that's that's a good point. Yes. And there if, we go. There are several types of insurance. We get lots of types of yeah. insurance. So let's first of all talk why we should have insurance. Yeah. I mean, insurance is, is some way I call it an, a necessary evil, right? It's you're building your financial house. You're the insurance is like the foundation. You know, no one wants to spend a lot of money on their foundation. They want to spend it on the the windows and the brick and the other things that make the house look pretty. But you know, if you build your financial life on a rocky foundation, it's gonna your It'll everything crumble. you build. On, yeah, it's, it's gonna crumble. crumble. Yeah. So it's a lot like that. The insurance is the foundation to your house, your financial house, and it's an important thing from that perspective. You know, insurance is really there to protect against the catastrophic. So the small things are always going to go wrong. You need new a new uh, tires on your car, right? You, your house needs a new roof. Those things we can plan for. Those things we can have an emergency fund for. You know, with insurance, we're really trying to uh, protect against those big life events that just could wreak you know, financial havoc. You know, your house burns down. You, you lose a loved one that is providing... Uh, financial backing to the to the household. You know, those are the things that are catastrophic that you need insurance. It's important to have insurance in place to replace that lost income, to re help rebuild the house. That's where the insurance comes in place to, to help protect against those catastrophic things that you can't really pay for yourself. Okay, Tony, let's go back and actually define for me the types of insurance that are available. There are so many out there, it seems. Yeah. So we're going to talk about a couple of different types today. We're going to talk about life. Everyone's pretty familiar with that. Uh, disability insurance, long-term care insurance. Uh, no one likes to think about our own demise uh, and needing help and being in a nursing home, but it's important to think about that risk. Property and casualty. Everyone has probably thought about that in one way, shape, or form and probably is pretty familiar with that. And then umbrella insurance is kind of a, a sub segment of property and casualty that most people should think about, but not all people have. So we're going to kind of hit the highlights on a lot of these things today. Okay. Life. Tell me about it. Yeah. So, so life insurance, people are probably fairly familiar with life insurance. You know, if you have life insurance, if you pass away, it, it pays, right? And that's especially important if that person is providing financial income to the household. You know, think about uh, a young family still working, they have children saving for retirement. If the breadwinner passes away, you know, that how that family, that household is going to have a lot of a lot of pain and without having some life insurance. So that life insurance is really there to replace that lost income if that person passes. And you know, the older you get, you know, in theory, your need for life insurance should diminish to some extent if you look at life insurance from an income replacement perspective. You know, every breath that we take, every day that we live, um, the, the more that we save towards retirement, the idea is you're going to need less and less insurance over time to replace that income because at retirement, in theory, you're self-insured. You, know, you, you don't need to replace that income. You've saved this bucket of assets. So life insurance specifically, and there's a couple of different types. There's permanent insurance, which is in place for your entire life, or there's term insurance. Generally, we think that term insurance is a better option for most folks because it's going to, it's generally more affordable. 
and it's going to cover um, it's going to cover the income replacement of of that person. So if you think about you know a thirty year old with a couple of kids, they're going to need term insurance for a twenty or thirty year period of time. At which point, at the end of that time, the kids are out of the house. They've paid off the mortgage. They've saved for retirement. The need to replace that income, the need for that insurance, is diminished at that point. If they were to re up it, though, wouldn't it be more expensive? Yeah. So if you keep it, you know, level term would pay, you know, for that period of time. So if it's a 20 year term, it's going to be a level term, a fairly cost effective term insurance premiums over that period of time. If you get to year 21 and you decide that you want to keep that insurance in place, the cost goes through the roof. So the only time you, when you buy term insurance, you're really thinking about just covering a period of time. And after that period of time, you're going to let that policy lapse because you don't need it any longer. Okay. Disability insurance. Now, this is something that I have heard many people say, oh, I'm not going to get this. It's just extra money out of my paycheck. I'm not going to get this disability. Yeah. Uh, you know, people tend to be less, less familiar with disability, um, often because your employer may offer something automatically, um, or people think, well, that's just not going to happen to me, Patrice. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be disabled. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and that's really faulty thinking because per the social security administration, one in four 20 year olds are going to be disabled for at least uh, a year at some point between now and re in their retirement. And, you know, if you become disabled for an extended period of time, that loss of income could wreak financial havoc on the foundation, on the, your foundational uh, financial life. Not only are you losing the current income, but you might be dipping into everything you've saved. Dipping into savings, you can't save for retirement if you lost that income, you know, so it really, it's kind of a, a double or triple whammy uh, if you become disabled and, you know, it's actually a higher percentage rate to become disabled than to pass. So having that disability insurance is important. All right, so your employer offers a disability. How do you know if you need to supplement that? Right. So there's kind of two different types. There's short-term and long-term disability insurance. A lot of employers offer both. Long-term is really the important one because you, know, you can, if you became disabled for a short period of time, oftentimes you can self-insure by having a, a sound emergency fund, having some savings, you can cover some costs for a period of time. But, you know, for that one year, that five year, that, you know, 15, 20 year disability situation, that's a whole different ballgame. So having the long-term disability in insurance is the important part. Um, and generally, you can get disability insurance that covers a certain percentage of your salary. Generally, that's 60 to 70% of your salary. Generally, it covers you until age 65, you know, until retirement age. Um, you know, so that's kind of typically how it works. And as I said, you know, oftentimes most people think they have adequate coverage through work, right? But you need to look at that coverage to determine whether it's the definition, whether the, the amounts uh, enough, whether the length of the coverage, you know, as far as the amounts concerned, you know, you could get capped out. So for instance, let's say that it covers 70% of your salary up to $5,000, but you make a hundred thousand dollars, right? It's not much. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to cover five. You're going to be, um, left short. You think it's covering 70% of your salary or 7,000 and it's only covering five. So you're going to have a shortfall there. So looking at the amount and the cap is important. The length of coverage, typically that, that lasts until uh, retirement age. But we need to look at that. And then also the definition of coverage. So there's typically, there's a couple different definitions. The two main types are own occupation and any occupation, which is based upon your education and training. So for example, if you have own occupation, let's say you're a doctor performing surgeries, you have hurt your slam your hand in the door and you can't perform surgeries anymore. You can still visit, you know, do office visits, but you just can't perform surgeries. So in the own occupation definition, you're going to get paid. You can still do office visits, but your disability insurance is also going to pay what you were making before. 
So that's the own occupation. You can still do something else. You just can't do what you were doing before the disability policy pays. The what any that? occupation based upon education and training would be more of that nature. So, you know, if you could, you're a surgeon, you can't do surgery anymore, but you can do office visits, then it may not, the disability policy may not pay because you can still do an occupation based upon your training and education. Got it. Got it. The next one is long-term care. Now, this is something that we've heard a lot about in the last several years. It seems to be, uh, I don't know if it's gaining in popularity or if it's just gaining in necessity, but yeah. long-term care insurance. It's probably necessity more than uh, popularity. No one wants <laughs> yes. to think about long-term care insurance. True. True. No one wants to think about needing someone to come in and help them do stuff that they can do. Um, no one likes the idea of being in a nursing home, but you know the costs are there. And being bringing care into your house or going to a nursing home, you know you're looking at costs of you know, up to hundred thousand dollars plus per year. You know, so if that happens, that could wreak you know some pretty financial havoc. Yeah. Especially if you think about you know, okay, you've got a, a, a spouse that's living in the house, and you still have the covered the expenses that kind of cover their lifestyle. And then you're doubling up those expenses by having, you know, some big expenses on a nursing home or something of that nature. So the, so long-term care insurance is important to at least think about how do you cover the costs? Do you decide to self-insure or do you decide to shift some of that risk to the insurance company? And, you know, there's, it kind of kicks in long-term care insurance kicks in when one of two things happen, you either have cognitive impairment or you can't think clearly, and or you need help with your activities of daily living, which is kind of things that we're doing every day, Be, break, excuse me, bathing, eating, um, toiletry, dressing, things of that nature. So that's when, if you have those things and you have a long-term care policy, that long-term care policy will kick in. The, uh, the costs, yeah, so here, here's the, uh, you know, the other side of the coin, right? It's great to have coverage, but, you know, the, the, the problem is, is the costs have gone up, you know, fairly significantly over, you know, the last 15, 20 years as this industry's gotten a little more mature. So it's potentially a sound decision to have a long-term care insurance policy, but it's really a matter of taking a look at the risk, deciding whether to self-insure, can you self-insure, do you want to self-insure, or do you want to shift that risk to the insurance company, and then taking a look at the different elements of a long-term care policy to decide how to build that policy. There's elimination period, which works like a lot like a deductible. Um, you know, it's not going to pay for the first 90 days and 91 days it's going to pay. Um, the, the term of coverage, the amount of your daily benefit that it can pay. So taking a look at all the, the, the elements of a long-term care policy and potentially building one that suits your financial needs. All right. Now, property and casualty, I think most people know if you own a house, it's probably included in your mortgage. So it could be included in your mortgage you know, or you're required to have it yes. um, in one way, shape or form. So you're talking about homeowners insurance. Um, you're talking about rental insurance. You're talking about auto insurance. So we're all most folks are familiar with property and casualty in one shape, way, one way, shape or form. The. Uh, and property and casualties really a specialty. And you know, there's a lot of uh, terms and lingo. You know, we don't get deep into property and casualty insurance. Besides, you know, my biggest recommendation is that you know we put a policy in place, and then we may not look at it for a little bit. The annual renewal comes around, you make the payment, and you don't really think about it. It's important. My recommendation is to reach out to your insurance agent every couple of years just to review the coverage that you have, the costs, making sure that the coverage is still appropriate, uh, making sure that you shop around on costs and make sure you're still getting a good deal for the benefits that you're getting. All right. Now you mentioned umbrella insurance. What's yeah. That? What's that? Yeah. So everyone has property and casualty or most people do in one way, shape or form. We do proactively all the time talk to clients about umbrella insurance and umbrella insurance is kind of extra insurance that walks around with you. So for instance, you may have uh, liability coverage for your, your home and auto that covers up, covers up to $500,000. The umbrella insurance kind of sits on top of that. 
So for instance, if um, you're in a car accident or you have a trampoline at your house and there's a bad accident oh. there and your homeowners or your car insurance doesn't cover it, it would cover on top of that. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I mean, and it could also cover, in addition to that, it kind of walks around with you. So it could cover, you know, situations like libel or slander uh, or unique situations like, okay, you're, you know, pack uh, sandwiches for a kid's field trip and it triggers some food allergy. There's a lawsuit that results. The umbrella coverage could provide some benefits in it, it, to help offset the, uh, the loss, the cost of the lawsuit. Okay. You have a story here, huh? Yeah. So this one's really near and dear to my heart. Uh, unfortunately, when I was a senior in high school, uh, soccer practice took two kids home from soccer practice. It was raining out. We, uh, we were going down a steep hill, hit the brakes, slid into someone else, hit him head on. So we had two kids that were injured in my car, including myself, plus the person that we hit. So there was some pretty severe injuries and we were sued. We had, we did have umbrella insurance. We had $500,000 of liability coverage and my parents, we had serious conversations with attorneys about, are we going to need to file bankruptcy? Are these, are we going to get sued for more than the liability coverage? You know, so we were thinking those were scary things and adult conversations that were happening as I was trying to recover from, you know, a bad accident and, you know, having an umbrella and policy on top of that would have relieved in a lot of that financial stress and the risk of, of bankruptcy. That's a pretty heavy story there. Yeah. Fortunately, it was a friendly kind of settlement and everyone settled for what was in place, but it didn't have to go that way. All right. Well, let's wrap this up with a good summary of all these types of insurance, because as you say here, you're never going to be younger or healthier than you are right now. Yeah. So when's the right time? You know, you're never going to be younger or healthier. If you need insurance, now is the time to get insurance, right? The difference is, is that everybody's situation is a little unique. If you're in your mid thirties, you got a young family, you're saving for retirement, you're going to need life insurance. You're going to want to have, make sure you got proper disability, property and casualty. As we talked about, as you get older and you save for retirement, the need for life insurance may diminish some. So that can kind of fall off. When you get into middle age, do you want to start thinking about long-term care insurance and how that, how that may uh, affect and, and how that may benefit your financial situation? So at the end of the day, Patrice, we all have limited resources, right? I mean, we're trying to save for retirement. We're trying to have this foundational uh, insurance house in place, and we have limited resources. So the hard part is how do you allocate all those limited resources? And really, that's where we can help. We're not insurance agents. We get to know your financial situation, your life situation, and help look at and make help you make common sense decisions to build that financial foundation for your house and help make decisions confidently. I, that's what we kind of do every day is working with folks to take a look at those resources, how to allocate those resources and help them make decisions with confidence. And how can they reach you at Foster and Motley, Tony? They can reach us on our websites, probably the best place at fosterandmotley.com. F-O-S-T-E-R-A-N-D-M-O-T-L-E-Y.com. All right. Don't ignore the insurance conversation. And as Tony said, the folks at Foster and Motley can help you. Follow this Foster and Motley podcast about life and wealth for more topics and insights. And please share with others. Thank you for listening to Foster and Motley, a podcast about wealth and life. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information discussed and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Foster and Motley. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions regarding your financial planning and investments. Foster and Motley is not affiliated with any third-party providers. Any mention of a third-party provider does not imply an endorsement of that provider. If you decide to utilize a third-party provider, you do so at your own risk.